Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> All right. So, one of the things that I've often found amazing is just how many of us believe that if life should hand us a lemon, we can do what? Make lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> but I've often wondered, what perhaps if life handed us a bunch of guineps, how many of us would know what to do with these? By show of hands? <laughs> Not so many of us. How about if life handed us an apple, how many of us would know what to do? <laughs> Everybody? Certainly, if life handed us this apple, many of us would know what to do, but what about this one? As it is also called in my home country, Jamaica. And the fact is, life doesn't only hand us things that are strange or things that are new. Sometimes what life does is help us to challenge our own perceptions of reality. So let's look at the word uncle, for example. In many countries, an uncle is known as the term we use to refer to a mother's brother or a father's brother. But as you would know, in China, that's quite different. Multiple terms are used to refer to this person. So it is a fact that life doesn't only hand us lemons. And we know this, all of us in here, we know this because we have had similar experiences in the traditional classroom. For example, in some cases, we may be handed a simple problem like this one. One plus one is equal to? That's right. <laughs> but how about in the English as a foreign language classroom? For example, we may be handed this Japanese phrase and asked to translate it to English. Watashi wa? How many of us would know what this means? A few of us? On three? One, two, three. I love you. Very good. Yay. <laughs> so the idea here is that life doesn't always hand us lemons, and we know that to be a fact. We know that to be true. And it's interesting today for us to be talking about the fact that life is not always predictable. Sometimes it's on, it, you know, it hands us the unknown. At other times, it hands us things that are difficult, seemingly difficult. And at other times, what it does is brings us into a perspective where we have to challenge what we call facts. And I think it's interesting that we're discussing this today as we talk about being dauntless. And see, the question I want to ask is, how do we help our future leaders and our future builders to become dauntless? That is, how do we help our students to become dauntless? I personally think we can do so through the process of education. And that's very, very, very interesting for me. <laughs> because growing up, my mom would often say, what I have to give to you is the gift of education. My brother and I grew up hearing this a lot. But honestly, there were so many other gifts I'd rather have. <laughs> and so this has caused me to ask myself several times, what exactly is this education that she was talking about? What is it? And now as an educator myself, I am better able to understand that education is the process through which we help students or people to prepare for the future. Isn't that strange? <laughs> we have a process to help people to prepare for the future. But the future is unknown, isn't it? So how then do we help them to prepare for an unknown future? What I do know from being in the classroom is that when students see something that they do not know, they use the words I and can't. And so, I'm here today to ask, how can we help students to become dauntless? 
that is fearless and determined in the face of the unpredictable? How can we help them to do that? And what we do know is that in the process and through the process of education, we cannot assume that we can dismiss all of their icons. We certainly cannot do it because the future, as we have already said, is unknown, right? So my suggestion here today is that what we should do instead through pedagogy is to help students to rethink how they look at their icons, not to get rid of them, but to rethink how they look at them. And I think this is very interesting because the difference between being dauntless and seeing something as seemingly daunting is how we think about it, is really how we think about our icons. And to do this, what I want us to do, because we're talking about students here, is to look very closely at the words I and can't. And the first thing that we're going to look at is the T in I can't. And this T affects how students think about their I can'ts. When they think about it, they think about something that's troublesome, tiring, too much, too difficult, right? And what we need to do is to help them to rethink that. And how then can we help students to rethink the T in their I can'ts? How can we do this? There is a story I once heard. This story was based on an interview with Steve Jobs called The Lost Interview. Steve Jobs was asked, up to this point, what had motivated him to do the work that he had been doing? And his response was that as a youngster, he read an article in the Scientific American Journal. In this article, which was published in March 1973 and written by S.S. Wilson, what they tried to test was the efficiency of locomotion among different species. So we're talking about lions and bears and fish and tigers. We're talking about everything. And at the end of the test, the condor, a really mighty bird, was number one. And down on this list was the human being. But some brilliant person decided that what they wanted to do was to put the human being on a bicycle. And by putting the human being on a bicycle, what happened was that the human being outperformed every single species on that list. And what Jobs decided, or what he learned from that, was that we as human beings are tool builders. We can build the tools that will help us to surpass our innate human abilities. So for me, what I'm suggesting here is that we help students through pedagogy, through classroom instruction, to rethink the T in their icons, to rethink it from being something that's troublesome to something that is a tool, to rethink it from being something that's tiring to a tool, something that's too much to a that's right. But the thing about tools is that sometimes we often present tools to students. So what I want to suggest here are three ways that through classroom instruction, we can help students to think about the tools that will be presented to them or tools that they will need to build along the way. The first one is how we introduce tools to the classroom. Once, you know, what I understand is that traditionally teachers bring tools into the classroom. They present it to students, they give them instructions, they show them how to use it, and then allow them the time to use it. My suggestion here is that we allow students to bring their own individual problems to the classrooms and allow them the time over the semester, over the term, to provide and to create and to think about the tools that can be used to solve these problems. Secondly, we need to have our students dare greatly. As in the case with the uncle, what we have found is that in different situations, what we call facts may be quite different. 
And so what I'm urging us to do is to one, help our students to approach each situation with a fresh perspective. Secondly, to be daring enough to ask questions for things that they do not know the answer to. And thirdly, thirdly, to be strong enough to be wrong. And as we talk about being wrong, if we're educators, it's very, very, very important that we assess how we evaluate what is wrong. So, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson had this simple idea to look at knowledge as an answer versus knowledge as a process. And I think this was quite interesting, though simple. What he suggested was take a look, for example, at a spelling bee competition. And there were three students in the spelling bee competition. And they were all, you know, they were all asked to spell the word cat. The first student goes up and they spell cat C-A-T. They're right, right? Yay. The second student goes forward and spells cat K-A-T. They said that the student was wrong. The third student, for example, went forward and spelled cat WQC. They also said that that was wrong. The problem Dr. DeGrasse found with that is that KAT and WQC were deemed as being equally wrong. That's quite interesting. Because as far as we know, KAT is closer to the phonetic spelling of cat than CAT. In addition to that, in an unknown and unpredictable future, as educators, instead of looking at QWC or QUC as being totally incorrect, perhaps what we, what we could do is have students explain the process that they took to get to that answer, as opposed to tell them that the answer is completely wrong. So that's my first suggestion as to how we can help students to rethink their icons through helping them to rethink the T in I can't. Secondly, I want us to look again closely at the words I and can't. And there is this beautiful apostrophe. For me, the apostrophe is like a beautiful flower because what it does here is functions as a contraction. And what it does is removes the word no from the word. So it's almost like, it's more beautiful and digestible to say I can't than I cannot because the word no is no longer there. But the truth, the truth is that once we say I can't to ourselves or students say I can't to themselves, what they're really saying is that they cannot do it. They're telling themselves no. And in some cases, they're telling themselves no. And in other cases, these are no's that are imposed on us by society, imposed on students by other people who think they know more for the students. As we think about no's, I'm sure that every single one of us in this room have faced no's in our lives. But many students come to the classroom with an experience of yeses. They have only heard yeses. <laughs> so when they hear a no, they think it's strange. They think it's the end of the world. And as teachers and educators, we have a responsibility to help students to understand that no's are similar to laws of nature. They are actually a part of life. And what we can do is to help them to regret or to neglect those no's, I'm sorry, neglect those no's. And how we can do this is to stand boldly and tell students about the no's that we have faced in our own lives and how we have rejected them, even though at times that may have been difficult. Because the truth is, for toddlers, for kids, sometimes teachers are their first heroes. And long before they start reading autobiographies, the lives of the teachers are all they can observe, as, as well as other people they respect around them. I know it's difficult sometimes to tell people how you have faced no's in life, and what you have done to reject those no's. As for me, when I lost my mom, I was about 17. And at that time, I was told, 
no, you cannot go on to do an undergraduate degree. The resources are just not there. And I had to reject those no's. Not only have I completed an undergraduate degree, I've completed a master's degree, and I've just completed my first year as a doctoral student. We have to teach students to reject the no's. Further on in life, when I thought about moving to Japan to teach English as a foreign language, up to that point, I had visited many countries. You know, and I told myself that I was still just a little girl from a rural town in a third world country. I told myself, I don't know how I would be able to teach or contribute to English language education in Japan. I told myself those no's, but somehow I had to reject them. And seven years later, not only have I contributed to the education of thousands of students in Japan, I've traveled all around Japan and South Korea to train teachers on classroom instruction. And every single day in my profession, I'm faced with no's telling me what students can do and what they can't do. You're told through research, and research is research, right? You're told students cannot use English to do this, cannot use English to do that. And every day I stand up through my research to try to reject those no's. My research is really embedded in trying to find approaches and methodologies that will help students to use English in the real world, logically, appropriately, confidently, and competently. That's what I do. So, what we do know, what we do know for sure, is that life does not always present us with lemons. There is an unknown future that is awaiting the students that we teach every single day the students that we know in our communities every single day. And what I think we could do, which would be a great service to them, is to help them to rethink their icons. And by doing that, we may certainly, certainly help them to develop a deeper sense of fearlessness and determination as they walk boldly into the unpredictable. And talking about tools today and talking about rejecting no's, it brings me back to a poem written by R. Lee Ralph. And an interpretation of this poem was put in song by a Jamaican reggae group, Leroy Sibyls and the Heptones. And this song has inspired generations of Jamaicans and reggae lovers all over the world. And the poem says, isn't it strange how princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings. And the song goes, and just like common people like you and me, we'll be builders for eternity. Each is given a bag of tools, shapeless mass, Whoa, and a book of rules. Thank you. <laughs>